Welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker, and for this conversation we are joined by Cadell Last. How are you, Cadell? Fantastic. Nice to be here, Dave, and uh, hope your stream's going well. Happy to be a part of it. Yeah, it's really great to have you on board. For anybody who's not familiar with Cadell's work, he writes about uh, cybernetic futuristic, you know, uh, <laughs> singular brain shit, and at the same time comes from a hard science background, but he's super into Hegel and Slavoj Žižek, and more importantly and recently, as far as like how we started collaborating together, he is the founder, director, lead instructor for Philosophy Portal, which is an organization also doing underground theory in a sense. Um, you, like me, have a big interest in making this stuff available to people, but also doing it in non-suffocating environments. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I definitely vibe with, the idea of, of, of underground theory, I mean, in some sense, it's underground in the sense that it's, I, if, if we define underground as not being in a traditional academic institution, and it's also deeply committed to, to, you know, to theory, and that theory is worthwhile, and theory is valuable, and actually, theory is kind of like the, um, the water we, we swim in, or the air we breathe. Um, and so if we don't pay attention to theory and if we don't make theory accessible, um, and I'm talking like for me, you know, thinking about the foundational theoretical texts of the modern world, that's sort of how I approach it with, with philosophy portal, then we're not going to be able to be informed when it comes to contemporary politics, contemporary technology, contemporary econom economy. Uh, so, yeah, incredibly important stuff, and suppose that's that's literally uh, <laughs> what I that, that's 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 my my day and night basically. Mm hmm. So that's your day and night. That's your your life struggle in a sense. Yeah. And I want to that the topic of our conversation today is killing ourselves with texts. Basically, we want to talk about death drive. And taking on challenges that are so hard, we feel like we're dying, which it's a fitting point in this in this first day of li li uh, marathon live streaming because we're over halfway complete. But uh, we were supposed to start like 15 minutes ago, but I had to. I had to eat. And thankfully, Anne was a step ahead of uh -huh. me. She'd actually prepared me something. And then she, she even like popped my back. Like I really needed that. And it's like... You know, in, in taking on the challenge of like a 12 to 14 hour live stream uh, in itself, not uh, apart from the two day part of it, the, the main thing I think I forgot about was like, oh yeah, eating. I can run, <laughs> to, the ba I can run to the bathroom, but eating's actually like, it, it takes a certain amount of time. Like that oatmeal I had earlier, I tried to eat it between the Daniel Tut, Nina Power, and Christine Luigi Soli. I wasn't able to. I, I tried to eat it, but I just had to do so many things. And then, uh, so my, my oatmeal from that I was supposed to eat at like 7 a.m. is something I didn't eat until like almost noon. And oatmeal is not a very good lunch, first of all. Um, and so anyway, I'm very happy that I had some tacos. Um, but what are you doing in your life right now? What have you been doing with Philosophy Portal that is a, a serious challenge and that is in a sense killing you. Oh, well, okay. So, I mean, I think there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's one main thing. I mean, I think it's for me in my life is like from up till five minutes ago till about say the beginning of August of last year, I'm basically day and night into the science of logic. And, you know, I think I've read it like four or five times uh, since last August and just day and night trying to understand the ins and outs of the arguments, trying to understand the overall structure of the book and most importantly, trying to teach it and trying to bring it to life. And that's just basically been one of the biggest challenges I've ever taken on, to be honest. I mean, I remember 
when I launched the Science of Logic course, like announced it, I was just like, how am I going to teach this thing? <laughs> it's like this is in, this is an in, this is an insane project and it's like even more challenging i think and more daunting in some sense than the phenomenology of spirit because oh, at yeah. least with the phenomenology of spirit you're engaged with um say concrete objects like you're dealing with spirits objects as it's moving through the phenomenological journey and there's like almost like an intuitive way to, to, to teach that, to approach that. But with the science of logic, it's, it's so, so abstract. And some of the aspects of the book are just incredibly dense and you can get lost so easily um, that it was, it, it's been one of the biggest challenges of my life. But at the same time now, almost approaching the very end of the project, um, I'm going to be giving the last lecture on it um, May 1st in terms of the actual contents of the book. It's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And, and really what I conceptualize these projects as is, is, is my subjectivity dying into the object. And at the same time, that process of subjectivity dying into the object, in some sense, forgetting about myself into the object. Almost like I don't exist anymore because I'm just with the object in the drive of the object damn um like it's almost it's it's almost like that process you know you on the one hand you might say like why would you do that to yourself or, yeah like, what, you might what are you thinking sorry or feel bad for but on the other hand to me it's that very motion which uh saves me from like hedonistic loops to be honest like if i didn't ha like if i didn't have a project that I could die into, like, will, like, it's not like I'm being forced, like, it's not like I'm in a concentration camp, I'm being forced into a certain labor. I'm totally taking this on board myself, I'm positing that as my own necessity. And in some sense, like, creating an impossible, it's kind of like the Facebook post you made yesterday, where you're like, absolutely nobody, just crickets, and then two day marathon. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> absolutely, like, it's like, Absolutely nobody is asking for me to do the science of logic course, but here it is. I'm just positing <laughs> that's an absolute necessity, and I'm just going to die into this. And would you like to die into this with me? Well, come along. Come along and die into theory. And it, and it's like, again, without that process, um, without doing that, um, yeah, I mean, like what? Like video games, cheap, cheap pleasure, like... You know, just, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I just think that it, in terms of understanding myself, in terms of understanding why I do what I do, I feel like a very helpful model to understand my, my notion, my development is positing impossible projects, positing impossible tasks and throwing myself into them and failing along the way and hmm. you know that's 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 it <laughs> this this is this is the kind of conversation that we were having in a in a smaller form uh because we're both in the midst of like crazy projects we're both about to co-teach Alenka Zupancic which is what is sex um that which begins uh what in May uh in the ver in early May what is it like the the seventh? Is the seventh going to be the first lecture? Yeah, yeah. So we'll have four mini intensive, which first one's going to be May seventh. They're going to be biweekly, and that book is really special. I mean, I think that book is 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 was well. One, Alenka is just. Um, I don't know if she's underrated at this point because I think a lot of people do know about her. Yeah. But certainly she doesn't have sort of the name brand recognition as someone like Slavoj Žižek or certainly doesn't have the same readership as someone like Slavoj Žižek. But to me, Alenka is just as rewarding. Like she's just as sharp in terms of, you know, her, her theoretical capacities. And um, I think I think what is sex is is 
I say if I could summarize why it's an important text, I think it's it's because there's a tendency in, and we brought this up in our first live stream, but there's a tendency in philosophy to overlook the importance of sexuality. And there's a tendency in psychoanalysis to feel like philosophy is in some sense uh, un made, rendered unnecessary by psychoanalysis. And I think Alenka as a philosopher is trying to really bring Lacan uh, and think about Lacan on a philosophical level, as opposed to thinking Lacan, the anti-philosopher, we don't need philosophy anymore. We can just use psychoanalysis. And I think, right. you know, the history of the Lacanian psychoanalytic organization is proof that we, you know, we still need to have this higher order dialogue between philosophy and psychoanalysis. Right. Right. And so Alenka is awesome for that. Uh, she's also, uh, this work in particular is one that we have a couple of videos about. I'm not going to exhaust this one because the PSA that I've been playing in between um, all of the segments in the, in the marathon goes into it uh, in depth enough, I think, and it shows everybody how to sign up for it. It gives everybody a promo code and everything like that. And so I'm just going to leave that there. Um, Th this is something that you have taught in the past that you wanted you you were like well this is a cool way that we could collab uh, but also it's a way that some people can get, can prime themselves for tackling Lacan's decree in the summer you're teaching yeah. Lacan's decree in the summer I'm teaching Heidegger's being in time in the summer people yeah. I, I remember like uh, after I'd I, I mean, after I'd read it, being in time a couple times and just and, some light reading, just some light summer reading, right? some light summer reading. After I got to the point where I was able to at least, you know, write about it and I, it got published somewhere, uh, and I shared that I, you know, a piece had been published somewhere. Um, and I remember, I'll never forget uh, somebody. He was an older guy, and he said, he said, you know, congrats on getting published in an academic journal, but uh, really, just the fact that you were able to to read being in time in the first place is an achievement on its own, like that, that will forever change you, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know, I hadn't thought about it at that point about how this is a work like that. But what Link, uh, uh, Peter Sloterdijk has a anecdote from his childhood that was very formative for him when he was a kid. He said his mother who, was never really into intellectual things. She didn't really take on difficult books or anything like that. Multiple times as when he was a kid, she would pull the Critique of Pure Reason off of the bookshelf and hold it and just say that she's so happy to know that something like this exists uh, because even though it's not a challenge she wants to, she wants to take on, she's just she's she's grateful to live in a world where there are basically mountains that can be scaled in the mind, um, where you can actually develop yourself by taking on seemingly impossible challenges. And Theory Underground has had, uh, ever since day one, I'm going to pull it up here on the screen, um, on the homepage of the website, uh, a, a category called Essential Texts. And it's not all of the essential texts at Theory Underground. It's not like these are not, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, it's basically, I've got four, they don't know what they do, critique of pure reason, phenomenology of spirit, uh, dos capital, being in time, totality and infinity, simulacra and simulation. And that's all I have on there, even though obviously you can't really talk theory today without having a basis in Deleuze and Guattari and understanding how they relate to all of these other thinkers. You also probably have to pass through people like Badu and Laruel. Um, there's Derrida and Foucault and, you know, there's also philosophers who aren't in the continental tradition that we still have to engage with. And there's the, the yeah. history of philosophy, but then there's also like these current people. And so basically what I want to say though is three of the ones that aren't on the list are the science of logic, the logic of sense, and otherwise than being. And those are three that I see as mountains that are above the mountains here on the screen. Like those are ones that I feel like I'm just working towards. Like I already know the science of logic is on this other level than um, uh, Phenomenology of Spirit, which I have read. But it's like when I say I've read it, I've read it once. To say I've properly read it, I have to reread it and reread it. And right now I'm doing uh, – 
Slava Ujijic before they don't know what they do in the course that Mikey's teaching. Shout out to Michael Downs. Shout out to Michael Downs. And this is killing me. It's 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 like this is this is this is Hegel light, right? Mm -hmm. But the section on the four judgments just broke me. Because uh, here's the thing: I was underprepared, and I wasn't taking it as seriously as I needed to. And I was prioritizing other courses that I'm developing and blah, blah, blah. To be fair, you're doing a lot. <laughs> I, I, a little bit, cut, you know. Cut, cut, cut you some slack there. You know, like, you know just, just trying to run an online educational platform here. <laughs> it's, it, it is its own thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. Yeah. But, but, you know, that's what we're signing up for, you know. And yeah. so I guess what I want to talk about a little bit is drive and – uh, yeah. what it means to, to, to be the person who's like saying, Hey friends, you want to kill yourself with me? Come on. <laughs> Let's say, I, 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 first of all, I probably ruined any chances we ever had at algorithmic su success on YouTube by saying key K Y S in the first place. But you know, it kind of reminds me. It kind of, it kind of reminds me a little bit about Plato's cave and motivating people to leave the cave. It's like, like people are watching. Sort of, let let's say, like people are like watching. Uh, I mean, say people are on theory gram or right. something like that, right? That's kind of like looking at the uh, screen images on the wall, right? You're like, hey, you know, these screen images come from this place over here. <laughs> yeah. You like listening to people talk about books. You, you would actually enjoy listening to yourself think about books if you read them. And people would want to have conversations with you if you read them with any diligence or repetition. right? And so that was for me the big realization was uh, I can't get these things secondhand. Like I actually there's, – there's ideas and ideas are great. But then there's actually going the distance with a singular thinker, right? Like a singular thinker who gave their whole life to a set of questions. Going the distance in a primary work is the most valuable experience that has been almost disappeared in a lot of, in a lot of academic institutions for the most part. I think so. I, I haven't seen it. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen deep engage. I haven't seen an academia, and I, I've been through academia, but I haven't seen deep in. This is what I haven't seen in academia, and that's why this is why I'm building philosophy portal the way I am. Is I haven't seen prolonged deep engagement with foundational text. I haven't seen it. Like, like, if, let me give you the example. Of, like, I was in evolutionary anthropology. I was in evolutionary biology. No one, there's no class introducing you to, to for example, Charles Darwin. Mm. Like, and like, I'm convinced, I'm convinced that there's a lot of evolutionary biologists who simply haven't read Darwin. And you, and that's the thing is, you can become an evolutionary biologist in terms of, in a neoliberal paradigm, to, to have a specialized field where you, for example, study, I don't know, like macaques mating behavior during the spring. You know, but like, <laughs> like, and you could build a right. career doing that, but you actually haven't read the foundational text, which allow, which is basically, the, again, the theoretical background or the water or the air we're breathing, you know, the water we're, we're metaphorically swimming in. Right. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so if you don't understand the very axiomatic okay. presuppositional ground upon which you're building your career then you don't understand how it's connected to everything else you don't understand how and you don't even understand you don't even understand deeply the 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 the, the backbone or the, the 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 cornerstone of 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 what it is you've dedicated your life towards no and there are a lot of people who don't care about that which is fine but there also i think does need to be a space for people who are interested in in the foundations? Secret Asian Dan says, "How do we get to the point where everyone doesn't have to read Darwin?" Well, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, it's kind of like 
this this to How me many is people have read Dharma. Yeah. For, uh, first of all, we already are at the point where you don't have to read Dharma, and that's the problem. The issue is that, like, I mean, people read Dawkins or some shit. Like, they don't read Dharma. Darwin's not hard to read. There's no excuses here. It's so I'm just if, fundamentally, if you want to have a life of the mind, you have to cultivate fields like a farmer cultivates a pasture. You have to sometimes rototill that shit. And there's no better way to do it than with engagement with singular primary texts. There's just not a substitute. And so it's like, oh, everybody. Well, not everybody needs to do it. But if you want to have a basis in the field of biology, you have to do it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. I just want to make a point about that is that if you want a basis in the field of biology, there should – and this is where the, the, the divide between the sciences and the humanities is ridiculous because I could imagine if you had the humanities ethos in biology, for example, you would have deep literature studies of the evolutionary biologists, right? Like you would have deep literature studies on – you know, not not only Darwin, but Spencer and 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 uh, and 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 all of the the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. Right. You would have deep liter literary engagements and and see that as an important aspect of the field. You know, kind of like in the same way that you know, like when Lacan was teaching, he would like not only emphasize you better reread the actual texts that Freud wrote. Like, you better actually read the foundational text. But he also said the same thing for, like, for example, you should be rereading the symposium by Plato every year. Like he said, you should you should be rereading the foundations of Plato every year. It's, it's kind of similar to, you know, how I feel like people who are really engaged in, for example, the their um, religious tradition, hmm. like... You don't like I, like the people who are religious, but they never actually read the foundational text right. of the religion. Like like people who are actually engaged in the religious tradition, they reread the text throughout their entire life. Yeah, and that's because there's a, a field of the of the mind that they are cultivating, and we could say it's really their soul that they're cultivating, or something like that. There's a lot of ways of talking about it. And these things mean different things to different people approaching it different ways. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that um, this, this, oh, well, well, we, we shouldn't have to read it. Well, you know, first of all, you shouldn't have to climb mountains either. And you shouldn't have to be a violin virtuoso either. And you shouldn't have to be the best Tetris player I've ever met. No one's fucking saying that the value framework or the, 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 the hierarchy of recognition uh, that arises around these various fields is one that has to appeal to you or that you have to play by the rules of. Um, but insofar as you think and insofar as you might be an obsessive thinker um, and you like to run all over the place and think about all kinds of things, most of those things have a basis in some field somewhere. And that field has been kept out of reach of regular working people. And now even people who aren't regular working people but are salary track professionals, they even don't come within reach of it. They just know how to cite things that, oh, well, you know, I'll cite Bordeaux because I'll talk about Habitus to kind of pull off this part of my essay about whiteness. Oh, I'll talk about Foucault so I can talk about di disciplinary measures and I'll mention the Panopticon because that will show people that I've read shit. Oh, I'll talk about Levi-Strauss and say that structuralism's so passe. I'll, I'll uh, talk about Latour and say that, you know, I'm, I'm basically a nominalist now so I don't really have to read all these thinkers who use abstraction. Oh, I'm going to just say I don't have to really read you know, Durkheim or or Weber or Marx or Hegel is another one that in the chat there, um, Secret Agent Dan said, I have a similar line of questions for Hegel. Like, well, how do we get to the point where we don't have to read Hegel? Well, that's kind of like saying, how do we get to the point where we don't have to watch the greatest films ever made? How do we get to the point where we don't have to... See, I don't want to... How do we get to the point where I don't have to see the Great Pyramid? It's like, 
Well, we're at that point. Welcome to base camp. You don't have to do anything. You can put your thumb in your butt and watch TV for the rest of your life, and no one's going to stop you. Everyone's going to say, congratulations, you're doing what you desire. But you're going to die that way, right? You're going to hate your life that way, especially if you're a thinker. Yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah, I mean, to me, my experience of, of climbing up the academic hierarchy is actually that reading the foundational text is actually, in some sense, detri detrimental. Because you start asking too many qu foundational questions. Mm. Like, like, the best way to climb an academic hierarchy, at least how academia is set up today, is to just follow the secondary literature in the field, in the specialized field, which your supervisor uh, focuses on and gets funding from. Like, that's the best, like, if it you're is. just interested in moving up a hierarchy, then that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you start reading foundational texts, you're going to be too difficult to contain. Mm -hmm. You're going to start asking too many questions, and you're not going to be easily categorizable. Like, let me give an example again with Darwin. Is like, because I read Richard Dawkins. And I got influenced by the whole idea of the separation between science and religion. But then I read Charles Darwin, and it seemed to me like Darwin's own ideas did not fit easily in that separate categorization scheme. Right? Like, you start reading the foundational text, and you find so many rich nuances that are just lost in the pop translation. Where it's like, it's not as simple as that. But... Again, the thing is, is that if you're just reading the pop translations of the foundational texts, you know, you're, you're, or, or the secondary literature, which is not even in touch with the foundational theoretical ground, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you're going to have, you know, you're going to have functional simplifications, which actually, um, they might be more uh, uh, amenable to developing a, a specialized research program, but they're much less uh, capable of actually sense making in 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 the way that you know the Plato's of the world thought we should to live a, a, a life in search of the, the good, the true, and the beautiful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to this, I want to be fair to, to Dan in the chat because um, he has said that it feels like he's being misread. And I kind of suspected, you know, I wanted to, here's the thing. You said it in such a way that it's easy to interpret it as a, the way that people tend to to bring up an objection to everything that we do. And so that's how we've responded to it. But giving you your due and, and the fact that uh, what you said is that you feel the current line of discussion is a misreading of the question because you said at some point we want everyone to understand some fundamental issues and the original exploration of them is not the most accessible. And so, I mean, look, uh, base camp, it's, a, it's an argument about what base camp should be like. Should there be standards at base camp? Should people have some basic familiarity with the basic concepts of their life world? Um, and you're probably for saying yes. Everyone should be able to have some basic orientation to all the various fields uh, as a function of a general education without having to do this. But I do like that idea that you get that, that that you get an orientation with all of the fields and you you pick one to dive into and if that means that it's engineering then you actually go and you read like physicists ph ph uh, physicists you actually read them you feel you read physicists who are also inventors and you uh and and you read them in the primary text yeah i i think that i don't care what it is i think that you should get a basis in a field and that an education system that doesn't say, hey, are you ready to dive into something and then show you a bunch of doorways for, wh for where places where you can dive into the deep end is an education system that has failed us. And bringing it back to kind of like us, it's like 
it's not really like, oh, we're moralizing because we think everyone should do this. It's that we went for a specific kind of experience, or at least I, at, at university, at some point, I got turned on to a specific kind of experience that I then couldn't find much more of. Like my freshman year, a professor had me basically forced us to read primary texts because I got an F my first week in political and social philosophy because I, did, I just read the Sparks notes and did a quick little summary and uh, focused on my math homework, right? And then he said, you cannot do that because I, I went to his office hours with the F and was like, what is this? Like, what do you expect from me? And he was like, philosophy is not something that you can do at the beach. It's not something that you do in a half hour. It's something that you have to commit as much time as you're giving to math, right? Like you really I have guess, to- I guess that's what, like for me, I'm not saying that everyone should do this either. I don't think, I don't think we need everyone to read Being in Time. I don't think we need everyone to read The Origin of Species. I don't think we need everyone to read Phenomenology of Spirit. But I certainly think that if our education system and our university system is not is not dedicated towards having contact with a foundational ground, mm -hmm. then that's problematic. Right. And so Dan said it could be that the original texts are very accessible, just not with our current educational baseline. And to that point, there was, a, that. there was a time, like Mark said he was trying to write in a way where workers could understand him in almost everything he wrote. And then if you go read that shit today, that is not easy to understand. And so there has been a dumbing down effect. And uh, Neil Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Death talks about how uh, the citizenry of the settlers coming to the United States, um, the, the pilgrims and such, the, the literacy rate was like 98% for men, 97% for women. And this was a literacy rate that meant that they could read. Uh, I don't think Kierkegaard was around just yet, was he? Um, but they could definitely read the King James Bible. They could read the Iliad. They could read they could any you know, Homer in general. And so it's like uh, that's – and Shakespeare. That's a level that uh, people are not really obtaining anymore. And obviously – digitalization you know is to blame there's a new there's I've, we've we're in a new media time and so books are a little anachronistic in a lot of people's minds but no amount of listening yeah. to podcasts or 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 watching youtube videos uh, or while you're multitasking is ever going to suffice and that's kind of what our role is our role is to say look if you're having fun doing that great it's entertainment but if you're just looking to, 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 to find some confirmation bias and some things to pad out your worldview and some rhetorical tricks so that you can convince other people that you're not stupid and that you're not evil, like for sure, like th this, 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 this thing that we're appearing on in front of you today is going to serve up a lot of options. But it's very rare that you will find somebody, even on BookTube, who's going to say, I can't do it for you. And the reason for this, it's not just that the educational baseline is too low, Dan. It's more importantly, I think this is like the, the more serious issue, is that our expectations have been lowered, that our goals have been lowered, and that the, the issue with this is that we're never going to get to a point where the working class, much less anybody, wants to have its time energy if we don't have higher aspirations. So the thing is, is like every time somebody has the fear of missing out and gets frustrated or feels the time energy fragility of being like, I can't keep up with you guys, Cadell, you're just going too hard, man. Phenomenology is spirit. And now it's the science of logic. And now it's the accrue. Slow down. Like, what are you doing? Like, we can't keep up with you. This is not right. Or, or to me, like being in time in the summer, are you fucking crazy? No, absolutely not. Uh, yeah, well, get, just wait until the, the winter. We're going to do Totality and Infinity. And then in the spring, we're going to do Das Kapital. And I, no shame, no regrets. And it's going to be over and over again because it is the most rewarding thing a person can do. And it's been we've been sold a fake bill of goods. We've been sold the idea that Netflix and marijuana is a, is a suitable uh, uh, exchange for having a life of the mind.
And I love, I love Netflix. I love marijuana. That has nothing to do with it. The fact is, is like we need challenges. We need mountains. And if we don't take them on, and this is where I kind of want to turn to, then we just get caught in the, we just get caught in the, what were you calling it? The hedonistic spiral. You get a hedonistic loop. The loop. Yeah. And so. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, I mean, did you want to, did you want to say something else there? I can also. I want to hear about the hedonistic loop ver- and death drive and how you concept how you think about this. Well, I was just going to say, you know, like I was going to make comment on, on, you know, the project that's unfolding, uh, there with you and th- with theory underground. And, uh, you know, I've got my own sort of project, which, which has a certain intellectual backbone. And it's like, you know, what what are what are these what are these pro- what is the the higher order meaning or purpose of, of of this drive which i think is 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 worth worth reflecting on and for me i'll i'll reflect on it in in two contexts the first context is what i would say is the decay and the erosion of the academic institutions where i feel like a lot of people are not sort of um um, not only not engaged, but not convinced that we're really within a uh, meritocratic uh, society anymore. That, that, that this is that this is this is the, the place of higher lo- learning has itself become eroded. The other context would be at least what I've engaged in, which is like the broadly speaking, what's called the liminal web, which is basically people who are recognizing that the institutions have failed and they're trying to organize with other like-minded people online in terms of we need to build a new world. But a lot of the times it's very naive when it comes to the the foundational theoretical texts. So I feel like on the one hand, we've got decayed institutions, rotting institutions. On the other hand, we've got a lot of energy from engaged people on the liminal web who want to do something real they want to they want to change they they want to build something they want to build an alternative way an alternative way of learning an alternative way of living an alternative way of thinking about life and i think what at least the way i conceptualize philosophy portal and the way i conceptualize theory underground is that we're not going to be able to build something that in some sense outcompetes the institutions or is better than the institutions or that you know, engages some higher order network dynamic unless we're in touch with foundational theory. We need the foundational theory in order to build, in some sense, the new world, I think. And, right. and at least that's, that's what, I mean, that's where my sort of drive is going, is that we're in the void. We're in the void between two systems. We're in the void between, on the one hand, the legacy institutions of the industrial era of modern capitalism, mm-hmm. and we're in the void between that and something which is seems impossible to define. If we're just paying attention to the way our networks are actually acting, it's something related to digital network dynamics, but we don't know how to connect that and ground that to family dynamics, we don't know how to connect that and ground that to building a sustainable life and career and, and identity. And and that's all very fragmented. Mm. And I think that, you know, engaging like a project on your side, like being in time and does capital, well, that is very interesting. That's very intriguing. You know, how far can you take that combo? How far can you take that project? Right. For, for me in, 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 in my drive, you know, trying to work with phenomenology of spirit and logic is basically we need to have we need to understand how phenomenological journeys unfold. That's my idea here. We need to understand how phenomenological journeys unfold. We need to understand the foundation of modern logic. And then, you know, with psychoanalysis, we need to understand the bare bones of, of, of the discovery of the unconscious. And what can you do with that? I think that if you if you have a deep understanding of phenomenology, if you have a deep understanding of logic, if you have a deep understanding of the unconscious, 
that's going to help us avoid silly mistakes when it comes to building out new networks and building out a new world. I hope so. That's what it's about. You know, so it's not just everyone read these books. I don't think that. I think that there's a certain number of people who are attracted to Philosophy Portal. There are probably a certain number of people attracted to Theory Underground who are just theory nerds. <laughs> yeah. you know, like they go hard like they go hard into the theory and they love it and it's their jouissance and it's their death drop. Right. And it's their excess it's their excess enjoyment is they want to do that. Like they're paying to do that. Right. And I'm trying to facilitate the best possible education I can in that direction. But what I hope is is that the consequence of our work and I think there's many overlaps and synergies I hope the consequence of our work is that that has ripple effects in the liminal web. Because if it has ripple effects in the liminal web, what it means is that the philosophical discourse is, is higher. Meaning, for example, is that can we improve the discourse around sexual difference? Well, that's why we're doing what is sex. That's a right. big topic, right? Is that important? It seems like it's absolutely central. Because what's the ground of civilization? The, the ground, the mo motor of civilization is sexual difference and the family structures and the community structures which, which emerge around sexual difference. Can you have a community? Can you have a society? Can you reproduce a community in a society without understanding sexual difference? Literally impossible. So we're, uh, well, we're not just, you know, I'll just end there. It was possible because because people just lived in well, traditional people had religious societies. Structures. Right, exactly. They just had religious well, structures. Had religious just, structures, which right. was let's say the unconscious externalized. Right. And and socialized and ritualized and mythologized. Right. And and you know and and that's and but the thing is is that we're at a place in our evolution where we have this collision between primal drives and a virtual global web which has in some sense revealed our unconscious to us and we cannot you know we cannot uh at least the majority of us cannot go back to a pre-modern mythological understanding of the world that doesn't hold things together that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't so and, and I understand, I understand people who want to go back to something like that. It, again, provides comfort for the identity, stability. It provides a, a, a global whole. It provides a coherence. But I, I, just, I just don't think that that's going to cut it for, for the majority of people and... I just think there are so many challenges and so many paradoxes which the modern mind confronts, which you're not going to be able to confront without philosophy. And in some sense, that's the revenge of philosophy. I've called it the revenge of philosophy because I grew up at a time where philosophy was, in some sense, perceived as dead. You know, like you have physicists like Stephen Hawking who say philosophy is dead. You'll have the emergence of a lot of science popularizers who would give you the, the, the point of view, which all we need is science now and philosophy is over. You know, all you need is some evolutionary biology and some cosmology and, and, and you know, you can patch up the rest of the things with some liberal democracy. Exactly. You know, but, but that, but that, 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 I think we're, we're reaching the end of that point of view. Yeah. And we're having the reemergence of philosophy. And I think that this reemergence of philosophy, and I call the revenge of philosophy, mm. is coming at the same time. It's coinciding with the reemergence of geopolitics as a serious question. Because after the end of the Cold War, we have, for example, the divide between the capitalist and the communist world and that falling. And you have the emergence of a sort of general global liberalism. And there's this idea that the world is open now. There are no more major geopolitical problems anymore. That, you know, <laughs> we're all going to be one sort of, you know, liberalist international community. And I think that that 
image, I think that fantasy is 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 over now. And I think that we're having the reemergence of geopolitics. We're having the reemergence of serious, uh, let's say, multipolar conflict. Yes. And the world and and the world is not the world is not as open as we presumed under a sort of neoliberal idea. Right. It's it and and I think the other and I think difference and I think cultural differences and I think just the other the neighbor mm-hmm. is becoming more like to maybe bring up something that might be relevant to think about in a Levinasian uh, way. Right. Uh, is 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 is, is in need of deep reflection because yeah, we we have our little tribes we have our little communities we have our little niche groupings to survive yeah. in 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 the yeah. world and we always have humans always have the, well, that's our the, spontaneous tribal mind right but in a society where you are, deal with the real on a daily basis where you might not get clean water and you might die. Where people you know, like babies are dying, women are dying in childbirth, where death is ever present, right? Negation is a lot more present. The real is something that people are kind of forced to tarry with, uh, especially in places that are inhospitable, like uh, especially places like desert dwelling people or rural people who are out in the thick of it in the sticks. Uh, the tendency is obviously you look out for your own first, but there is always this sort of, uh, no, I can't say always, but this tradition to be hospitable to the neighbor, which does not mean you better believe everything I believe if I'm going to let you into my house and you get to break bread with me. No, no, try to fucking see if that will fly in the desert. No, no, no. You see some other people and and you break bread together. It's not about like, oh, what do you believe? Obviously, if there's like a religious crusade underway or if the U.S. is propping up fascists in Saudi Arabia, then obviously there might be something like that going on. But the tendency is hospitality. And Levinas is fundamentally like the thinker of ethics and hospitality. And this means not collapsing radically other singular entities, cultures, etc., into your frame, into your value constructs, into no, we can try to be empathetic, but we shouldn't let empathy or 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 inability to connect uh, reduce the other in a way that makes them easy to discard. You might not want to have have someone be a part of your everyday existence, right? But we live on a really big big planet, and the 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 fact is is like right now this sort of, oh, philosophy's dead, science has it figured out, progressivism correlates with technology, and we're all just better every day, uh, except for the people who are going to die out, and they're the ones obstructing progress. It's pure colonialism. It's pure imperialism. It's pure uh, reductionism of all otherness into sameness, right? And so that's where Levinas really provides the language for thinking about this. He's thought about it more than anyone else um, ever. I mean, I know that other thinkers have a lot to contribute on this end, but no, Levinas is the thinker of this. And it's sad that he gets co-opted by naive progressivism, right? He gets co-opted as, uh, like, he, he's almost cited in a religious way by someone like Judith Butler, right? Like, she, she thinks that she can found a politics on him when he's fundamentally an anti-political thinker. I have to I have to actually say what that means. Like Game of Thrones. Who's the good guys in Game of Thrones? The Hunter Rentian, Emmanuel Levinasian positions. They're two positions, but they both have the same basic agreement, which is that there's not a correct side. It's no. there's there's good people, right? So if you watch Game of Thrones, Tyrion is a good person. He's flawed, but he's a good person. There are other people who are way more flawed, but they have their good moments that get cultivated and crushed. Um and then you've got people who completely opt out of the entire war and they just try to be good people and have a good life uh, and take care of their own. And Levinas is, go- is thinking, you know what, look, not everyone has to be a political totalitarian like war communism is forever. The, we, we, we have to remember that humans need to be human still. 
And if we're fighting for a future where humans don't get to be humans, then fuck off. Right? And so what he's for when I say he's a he's a political he's an anti-political thinker, the first pages of Totality and Infinity are basically saying thinking that war creates the conditions for peace is the presupposition of all statecraft. It's the it's also the presupposition of most philosophers. And he says, no, the peace is peace. And war as the presupposition for peace, that's not morality. If he says he says that the you know you get this cynical sneer from people who say, oh morality, right? Because they're the realists, they're the hard realists, they're the Churchills and Trotskys of the world, and they just go, no, we're the real deal. We see through all this morality bullshit. And obviously, I'm a, a sort of Nietzschean Marxist a, a, in a sense, so I can understand and appreciate the critique of moralism that you'll see by someone like Jonas Cheka in his How to Philosophize with a Hammer and Sickle. Um, but <laughs> no, I, do you know about that book? No, but I think it's a funny saying. It's great. Yeah, it, it, he just put that out pretty recently. Jonas Cheka used to be Cuck Philosophy, you know. Um, that's his first oh, book. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I know Cuck Philosophy. Yeah, how to, how to philosophize with a hand and sickle, where he kind of teases out similarities between Nietzsche <laughs> and Marx. Yeah. And I'm all about that because we hate moralizing, but that doesn't make, make it so that we just give up on trying to figure out what's right and how to live a good life and how to you know, live in a world with other people where they get to have a dignified life. And if we give up on that project, then I don't care. Anyone who's given up on that project, your politics is shit. I don't care about it. I hope you lose. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've brought up the word anti-politics a couple times on stream because really, like, I, I think um, I, I, at this point, my position is anti-political in a sense. It, I, I'm for radical politics, but I think the conditions for radical politics come from a period of moratorium spent doing anti-politics, which is theory that critiques all existing ideology and gets to the heart of every fundamental human question philosophically and if we don't if we can't give ourselves the, the questions in the chat well like oh well how do we raise the baseline for civilization how do you raise the baseline for yourself why don't you think about yourself before you think about the big other the big other doesn't care about you why don't you think about how do you raise the baseline for yourself the easy answer is right now you're watching this right now you're interested in these things you might not be later so give it everything you've got right now don't fuck around and waste your life. Someday, you know, these people, they exist. You, you meet them. Oh, I used to study philosophy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I really liked Nietzsche. Oh, yeah, I liked Plato. And they're drinking and they've not studied it for like 30 or 40 years. They had a time, right? And it's like, yeah, you were fucking hanging out, bullshitting, and most of what you're doing was talking without a basis and actually reading and reflecting rigorously. And now you, you say you've had, you gave it its due. No, you didn't give it its due. Anything that's worth doing seriously, if you're going to talk about how you did it, do it seriously. And so like for me, I'm not signed up necessarily to be a philosopher for the rest of my life. Maybe after I write the books that I know I need to write, it's over, right? But all I can say is while I'm doing it, I'm going to give it everything I've got. And that comes with a sacrifice in a sort of sense. But it's not one that makes me virtuous. It's one that just means you should just – when you see me – Doing a two-day marathon, give me a high five, give me a drink of water, you know, but don't do not do this all, oh my Maybe God. Maybe a couple of tacos. A couple of tacos, please. Maybe a uh, couple of tacos. Donate to the street, <laughs> donate to the tour fund, you know, but it's not, it's not like, it's not like, like, oh, this is, this is amazing. No, no, no. This is just a different way of giving myself a hard time and it's a way that's better than what it could have been. And so I like, I like what you're doing. On the one side, practically, this is – some people need this, right, in the way that we're talking about. They just need it. On the other side, hopefully something good could come of it, right? Well, I think if, if you're reading philosophy properly, it's going to have a, a self-transformative effect, right? Like and, and, and also, you know, like – well, the thing is, is you can read – well, I guess my view is is if you're reading philosophy in a sort of detached, passive way, in such you can just pick it up and put it down, and if nothing has fundamentally changed in 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 moving through in moving through philosophy, then it's it's not like it, it's not 
it hasn't been engaged with by like it depends on how you're engaging with it. It's almost like how you engage with philosophy is to my mind more important even like it the text requires your engagement with it. Right. The books the, it, there is the objective book, there's the object there, there's the object, there's the subject and what's really important is the dynamic between the two. And and you being in some sense there has to almost I would almost say like there has to be like don't engage with philosophy unless there's almost in some sense the a priori decision that you need to read philosophy. <laughs> you know? You I know like, like and yeah. then go into it like for example for me I didn't read science before there was an a priori necessity within me to to read science and be transformed by it. And the same thing with philosophy. I didn't start reading philosophy until there was an a priori necessity inside of me. So I need this now. And I need to be transformed by this. And I think that you know, in in both those cases, you know there there's something that I'll never look at the world the same way again. I'll never look at the self the same way again. Right. And and that changes the way it changes it changes the way that I uh experiment, engage with other people, build life projects, think about my relationship to family and 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 old age and 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 you know the minutia of day-to-day -day life. I'm excited to grow old, right? Like in a sort of sense, like obviously my back hurts quicker and all of these other kinds of issues that develop over time, but no, I've, I, philosophy is investing in having a good final 30 years, right? Philosophy, philosophy for on that specific issue, philosophy has matured my idea of immortality and eternity and infinity to the point where I no longer think of those things as... Um, detached or disconnected from my day-to-day -day life process. Mm. Like, uh, you know, like, I mean, that's like Hegel 101 is that like infinity and infinitude are not disconnected. Mm -hmm. Infinity and infinitude are, are, are deeply connected. And it, you know, in some sense, your finite life process is infinity. <laughs> you know, that is... That is infinity. And so I, I, if, if, I, you, if you really, if you really let that sink in, like if you, I mean, if you yeah. really let that idea consume the shit out of you, I mean that that changes my whole view on evolution. That changes my whole idea of religion. That changes my, that changes the whole way I conceive of myself and my participation in spirit. Right. I would just throw in there, like I don't. I, I'm guessing we probably have, we have, we would have to like sit here and actually flesh out like what is your metaphysics? Where are you coming from? What are you what are you getting at? How are you using these words? And it's a conversation I want to have, but really I don't. I also just want to read your books. But um, the main thing I wanted to say is just that, yeah, some, I think it was just a couple of years of philosophy broke me of the idea that it's like this evangelical creationist you know picture of heaven and hell versus nothingness as this like no actually nothing um and that what i mean is this is like you can't go with the greatest minds from the history of ideas for very long without realizing how little we actually know without you know part of what you learn is you you flesh out the the structure or the limits, the parameters on what can be known. And in doing so, like really get, g gaining a more robust sense for it, you realize like the preachers selling us eternal life or eternal nothingness, they're, they're salesmen selling comfort food. And there are <laughs> way bigger, you know, it's like... Uh, a little bit of theory of time shows us that they're like the main competing theories, which are all things that work within a physicist's sort of world view, um, allows for more possibilities than the ones that are on the table. 
And so it's just like, I just think that these dogmatic, ideological, oh, it's this way. Oh, it's that way. Oh, the other way is stupid. It's just like, it shuts off from like the, re the richer possibilities and close it forecloses the most important questions. Oh, those have been figured out. Go back to sleep. Go back to just YouTubing. Don't worry about it. You know, just go play Elder Scrolls and listen to Chapo Trap House. You don't have to fucking do anything, right? Like, just go listen to Joe Rogan and, and, and go fishing. Like, and, and both of those activities, by the way, are valid. I'm 100% a fan of a game that's as difficult as, say, Elder Scrolls that is like a genuine thing that you can take on for like a couple weeks and just give your life over to it. In the same way that I am like a huge fan of fishing, in the same way that I'm a fan of, or I'm not a fan of, but you know, I totally see the appeal of Rogan and Chapo. Well, I'm just saying. Well, it depends on it depends on your it depends on the way you're subjectively approaching it. Like if you subjectively if you subjectively approach Netflix in the right way, it's actually a gold mine. Absolutely. Like you can like you can learn a lot from like the, there's certain documentaries I'll watch or certain TV like even watching like I've I've gotten a lot of philosophical ideas from watching Game of Thrones. One hundred percent. Like yeah. even for example, like a, a political analysis or like a psychological analysis of our of our culture right now. Like for example, with Game of Thrones, the idea I had was that isn't it like really interesting that the most popular TV show in the world has totally annihilated the boundary between um, typical storytelling and cinema and pornographic violence and sexuality. Like there's no like. I'm almost like my senses were a, like my senses were disoriented watching Game of Thrones precisely because they'll show you sexual and sexual scenes and violent scenes, which most movies and cinema, traditionally speaking, do not show and cut away from. Right. And I'm like, they're not cutting away from this. They're not cutting away from this. They're showing me this like and I'm affronted by my. It's almost like the line gets blurred, you know, but like what's going on? Like, but there's, I have a philosophical question. What's going on there? Because in a typical story, you know, in a typical, again, typical movies, typical TV shows, you know, there's again, this clear cut difference between pornography, the real, which is just too much, too unbearable to, which basically break the story. And, and traditional storytelling where you say everything except that it's kind of like not there you know so and, and at the same time that's the most popular tv show like it's the most watched so you know what does that say about our culture right now what does that say about us right now you know that that line has been obliterated we're just gonna show I, I, you someone getting like boiling hot Oh my Lava god. Lava poured gold? on their skull. Yeah, melted gold. Yeah. Melted Pour gold. I'm, I'm like, oh my god, I'm seeing this. <laughs> they, I, uh, with that said, though, it's not glorified like a movie like 300, where the, 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 the fighting is like slow motion and, and sexy. It's not it, like that. It's, yeah. it's much more, it's much more, um, it's much more visceral and real. Like it's not like you know, like like a typical, like a, like a, in like typical, like almost ridiculous, ridiculous caricatures of violent scenes. Right. Like where it's almost like you're. It's so ridiculous. It's so unreal that it doesn't affect you. With right. Game of Thrones, there are certain scenes which are so difficult to watch. I have to get up and leave the room. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, so Anne I'm and like, I. Am I the only one who feels that way? <laughs> no, no. Anne, Anne is watching it for the first time with me. Um, she never thought she would get into it. I, I made her promise. I said I would watch like a season of Glee if she would watch the first season of Game of Thrones. And so I watched a few seasons of Glee because uh, it's something oh, you're, that's. You're a saint. Yeah, it's a way for her to de stress because uh, it's like comfort food or whatever. And, you know, for me, it is actually stressful. It actually stresses me out. But the – but in, in, a, in, in a way, it's worse than Game of Thrones in a sense. But anyway, so when we finally, when we finally started watching Game of Thrones – I'm not going to use any spoilers here because we're still watching it and she's not through it yet. 
Uh, but basically, you know, I, I said, look, there's only a couple seasons that I really want you to see so that you can get a couple shared reference points with me and actually care about a couple of basic characters. And after that, you don't have to commit to finishing it. And besides, there's only five seasons anyway. Yeah, I don't count the rest of the seasons because, look, the books aren't finished being written yet and the director just went off the rails. So uh, she got really hooked, though. Hey, right? She she got really hooked. And so for me, it's like one of the best shows with stakes and a, and a lot of different plot developments all going on in a, in, a, in a way that's like character development in an overarching plot. It's just like there's nothing really better. And, I mean, if they would do a proper Dune TV show, maybe – Right, but for now, there's no compete, no competitor, and so the. But mainly, it's about politics. People think, oh, it's about swords and knights or whatever. No, it's about politics, and it's about the real. And so you're saying, you know, bringing up the yeah, the yeah. fundamental. Yeah. No, it, it 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 shows you the real. It's 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 trying to force you to tarry with the negative, and you watch it as entertainment, but then it takes you out of entertainment, and you're not in entertainment anymore. And it makes you just sit there, no, and you you don't sit there. You get up and walk out. It's there no, are no, it, it 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 assaults you. Yeah, like I that's how I feel while watching. I, I feel I, I, I feel I feel a I feel assaulted, but I, but it's also again this I just to bring it back to like the main the main point I think of this this talk is that depending on how you are subjectively oriented. You can find deep philosophy everywhere. You can find deep philosophy on Netflix. Like, and that's the thing. And that's one of the things actually that Slavoj Žižek taught me is that is is that this traditional divide between a ivory tower philosopher and watching Netflix is a false divide. Uh, that that actually Netflix could be a source. You could find your next book. You could find an, your next book idea uh watching watching netflix and of course zizek is famous for like for my my first introduction to zizek was watching pervert's guide to ideology where he's all the time making interesting observations using cinema and you know like like one of my favorite like one of my favorite like examples from pervert's guide to ideology is like his his commentary on titanic like what if titan what if the boat didn't hit the iceberg right and his, you know, his analysis that, that Jack, like his, his analysis that Jack and Rose totally would have fallen apart within two weeks. Like Jack going to, <laughs> Jack going to New York with Rose and like Rose leaves her rich family and, you know. <laughs> and, then, like and, then, and then she would have basically, it w she would have ended up like Rockefeller's mom, right? Married to uh, some... You know, basically, guy who can't get serious, who's probably off scamming people while she's trying, while she's living D class A, like trying to, yeah, yeah, no, it wouldn't, have, it would have been miserable. Wouldn't have helped. But just that, just like that, I think, like, what I want to say is, like, methodologically speaking, the important thing there is that if you really let philosophy transform you or also psychoanalysis transform you or anything that you're really passionate about transform you in that intellectual sense, the whole way you're going to see the world, the whole way you're going to engage the world is going to be different. I know for me, it's, it's to the point where I find rich material in conversations with my partner, conversations with my friends, com you know, just going about my daily life it it it's in some sense by the by my very self transformation my entire life has become philosophically enriched mm -hmm. and 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 there's something very liberating about that there's something you know i don't i don't see the world the same way it's not that the world changes but the way i see it has changed and the way i engage with it has changed and 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 that is, I think, the the I want to say the gift of philosophy. It's also, in some sense, the curse of philosophy because you can also feel very alienated in that process. You can also feel very, you know, you can also feel like you you've lost something and and a certain naive relationship to the world, which is true. And 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 in some sense, philosophy is is very disturbing. Um. And, and well, that's, I think, why, like, that's why also I'm doing Philosophy Portal is because you can be disturbed with others. 
<laughs> yes. And it, You're not totally alone. Yeah, and so, like, I just want to, like, say as a sort of point, like, here, if you don't feel the challenge, because th there's, there's on the one side, people bring up objections to everything we're saying just to see what we'll say to them because they know that if they were to take on this line, then they themselves would have to deal with uh, these kinds of objections, um, which is fair. Uh, but there's also just the fact that, like, you might not be sold on something and you're perusing a lot of different things and you've not dived in deep on any of them yet. And if you're torn between learning how to DJ versus play the violin versus bike ride marathon or, you know, or whatever the fuck, like, and then philosophy is like something else that you're interested in. My bit, my main thing I'm advocating for is don't, don't feel like, oh, I'm judging you if you haven't dived in yet. Uh, no, but be, a, be a, just be a, just know that there is such a thing as diving in and that committing to something is, even if it's just for a few months or a couple years, um, inherently worthwhile. It will forever be rewarding at the, in the subjective sense that Cadell is bringing up. But I would say it also changes the fundamental reality of existence itself and that there is an actual ripple effect oh, yeah. and that um, the, the main thing, is that look the, the book you said you know you're talking about the subject that re, you know engages with this object but it also has to be like this reciprocally determining sort of unfolding dialectical uh, thing and you know you, you brought it to it's good enough if it keeps you out of trouble in other ways <laughs> right if, if it's good enough if uh, but also like there's hope that it is also doing good for the world um, and then uh, my my main contention is just there's certainly this. an orientation towards the good. There's an the, the, orientation the, towards the good. Are we having a we're having a, b a bunch of people come in? We just got two people to join. I know one of them. I don't know the other one, but I think the other one is probably just using a different name. Um, if we're getting raided by trolls, we'll find out soon. If we get pornography plastered all over everything, um, right. Uh, Someone's Hillary's name just changed to Todd McGowan. Oh, okay, so Todd's here early. Perfect. Uh, is it early or are we over time? Let's double check really quick. I'm a early. little early, Dave. Ah, uh, welcome, Hi, Todd. Todd. <laughs> hey, hey. How you doing? Welcome to the party. <laughs> welcome to the party. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So we, how early are you? Um, let's see. Double check. Uh, four I think minutes. five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so actually, you know, with that, I'm going to roll the, the PSA that we play, and then we'll come back uh, for the conversation with Todd. So, um, uh, Cadell, would you like to say any closing uh, words here? I thought, for some reason, I, I got a half hour off. I thought that it was in a half hour. Uh, my timer was even wrong. So, sorry about that, Todd. But Well, I mean, I so, like, we, we, titled, we titled it Killing Ourselves with Text, and... Right. and I think that the like, like at least for me, like it's certainly not saying everyone should do this. <laughs> certainly not. However, what it what it is saying, what I or what I am what I would say, is that if you think like if if you're sort of peripherally interested in philosophy and you think that you can just get by with memes and theorygram and like social media postings. Like, if you think that is uh, a philosophical education, and if you think that you don't need to engage in the actual text and develop your own writing capacities, like, I was talking with Master Signified Bodies, Andrew, about this, which is that he recognizes that the memeing and, and the theorygram stuff, that's very creative, and there's something incredibly skilled in being able to make those connections and make those memes. But we're talking, it does not replace developing your own writing and developing your own relationship to the actual text. Right. And in fact, we need to have a, a deeper relationship between these two because they're both important. And, 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 and I think like what I always saw in theory underground and what I try to do with philosophy portal is to, is to bridge, is to bridge that divide because I think, Philosophy is spontaneously in, in a lot of people's intuitions coming up as 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 important for the cultural moment. And if and if you're a part of that, 
I think that the way you should view theory underground and philosophy portal and organizations like that is that these are new openings and 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 avenues for you to really enrich and deepen your understanding and your engagement in philosophy beyond just a meme, beyond just a, beyond just an image. And um, that's that's really what I think these initiatives are for. And but on in a general sense, we could say that if you want to escape a hedonistic neoliberal loop in a personal sense, I do think you have to find some higher object to die into or to forget yourself into. You know, that, that doesn't have to be philosophy. You know, like for me, before becoming an academic, it was a- athletics. Like, and I, I, in some sense, died and, and sacrificed myself into athletics. It, it could be many, it could be many different things. But at least for, you know, our purposes and what we're aiming towards, it, it, it is, you know, philosophy. And, and I do think in some sense, ph- there is a revenge of philosophy and philosophy is no longer going to be just a, a peripheral activity with the sciences in the mainstream. I think actually it's the reverse that we're going back to the foundational text because we realize we really need this stuff. Perfect. You know, that's a fantastic close for now. Thank you so much for joining us, Cadell. Everybody, I'm going to roll the PSA and then we'll be right back with Todd McGowan. Take care. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important, yet neglected, for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 cheer is too much, consider donating towards Meals and Gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The Gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground.com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. 
just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? one of the most succinct and cutting-edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.